I am going to share with you my journey of my residency um, at the Cast Gallery in Plymouth. Um, I am seven weeks in now and I have one more week to go. Uh, so the work has changed quite a lot in the last seven weeks, but actually really significantly, I think in the last couple of weeks. Um, so I'm just gonna take you on the journey and show you some images. And uh, if any of you have any questions, yeah, it would be great to have them at the end. Okay, so um, I am at Cast Gallery, which is a contemporary art gallery uh, in Plymouth. And I was very fortunate to um, get it, this residency for two months with Camp. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through. So to start with, um, this is a picture of Cast on the left. And um, this is my studio that I've been working in. So obviously day one, I'm looking at this space, what's going on in the studio. It's a great big space as well. So it's quite fantastic to be working in there. So um, my initial proposal for uh, the residency at CAST was to uh, carry on with a project that I'd already started. And these little jiffies that you can see, uh, they're plaster jiffies. And I currently had a thousand of them. And um, my aim is to make 6,000 um, because the jiffy is the smallest unit of time. So each jiffy uh, is one one hundred hundred of a second. So I wanted to make a minute of time through jiffies. Um, so that was my intention when I started out for the residency and when I um, applied for it, I was thinking I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna start making the jiffies and if I can get 6,000, that would be fantastic because I really wanted to um, create an installation and I still do want to create an installation uh, where you have the jiffies will be piled in a hundred and you'll be able to walk the length of them. So you'll have like 60 piles of a hundred and I want it to take a minute to walk the length of the jiffies. So this is the big end of my first week. I'd like, I'm gonna make the jiffies. I'm starting to work on my jiffies. They, they're kind of spread out like a bit of a production line. So it, it takes a while for them to dry out. So as you can see, they're on the left side of the studio. Um, whilst over on the right side of the studio, during lockdown, I'd started to collect lots of different types of packaging and air packaging. Um, and I've become really fascinated by the air and things in the air. And um, previous work to the Jiffies, I was creating a series of drawings that were on um, tracing paper and they were layered up. So you could see kind of like the idea of if you could see a snapshot of the air or if you could see the invisible, what would be around us. So the, the drawings were made up of, uh, well, there was the cold and flu virus in there, um, which things are quite topical at the moment. Um, and then there was pollen and there was lots of different uh, bits of text, bits of maps, just things that are bouncing around us in the air. Um, so I've always had this fascination with the invisible and the things we can't see. So this was the end of my first week in the studio. So I kind of already had these two projects going on. I had all these kind of plastic plastic packaging and um, I wasn't really sure where they were going or what I was doing with them. I'd just been collecting them through the um, lockdowns. So these are a couple of the uh, plastic packagings that I've been creating. I started thinking about the air and the shape of air um, and I was reading about Plato and uh, sacred geometry and how Plato uh, gave all the elements um, a shape. So the air had the structure of um, a diamond shape. So I was kind of really thinking about shape and the invisible had been shape. What would those shapes look like? So I started um, manipulating the packaging, seeing the potential of the materials and what I could do with it. Um, so by the end of the second week, I was starting to make all these structures um, and shapes using the packaging, um, which was kind of really starting to shift my thinking about what I was doing, um, thinking kind of about the elements and things in the air and almost like making particles and that kind of idea of things being quite translucent as well and kind of things floating around us and all the things we don't see. Um, so week three, as you can see, there's still the plaster going on. The jiffies are still going on at the same time as well on the left side of the studio. Um, but the uh, structures are now sort of taking a bit more of kind of 
biological kind of almost organic forms, these kind of like mutant shapes um, that potentially could be floating around in the air, um, kind of thinking about biological forms, um, just thinking about things that are, we don't see and pockets of air and capturing air and what is in the air we breathe. And I've just literally become so fixed on the idea of what the air would look like. And especially now, given um, the post kind of pandemic world we're in about the preciousness of air and, you know, air being so uh, important, having that clean air and are we breathing in clean air? And what comes in this packaging that travels through the air and some of it comes from other countries and it's like that sealed contained air and kind of fascinating, kind of all of that is coming into play with what I've been making with the work. Um, as well as continuing with my plaster as well. Um, so week four, um, this was where I was at. Uh, there was a halfway point um, presentation. And actually this was kind of a bit of a turning point. So I started making these bigger structures that you could see on the left. And I was thinking about, um, I was reading about Anish Kapoor at the time and how his sculptures were the tips of, um, other worlds and a kind of like a glimpse into inner worlds and something else there and um kind of like he's got the piece that where it's like that pregnant wall as well so i was thinking about that i was thinking i've been doing a lot of dystopian fiction reading as well during the lockdowns i was thinking about the worlds of the future kind of dystopian futures other worlds the potential of what it would be like to th see other worlds and what the air around us I also started thinking about um, when you sometimes walk, even if just generally walking down the street or for a space, and sometimes the air becomes really like, almost like tight and it's difficult to breathe. And is there something around us? And is there that invisible? So I've just kind of the idea of what it would look like with the invisible. So I started making kind of these architectural uh, structures, shapes that you can see on the left. Um, and the piece on the left at the bottom, I was thinking it might almost be a maquette for something that I would kind of like to make much bigger. So it was like a big space that you had to navigate through that was kind of all invisible. So it's kind of starting to play around with um, the structure a lot more. So the kind of work's kind of developing into the biological forms, but still developing now into kind of architectural shapes as well. So there's kind of lots going on and I'm playing with and using the potential of the materials so they are kind of ribbed and that kind of structure of the air and how it's balancing in the air um, and then the piece on the left I started um, thinking about air pods and what it would look like so combining the plaster and the plastic air packaging together and kind of actually thinking about space in the air and um, it almost feels like for me it could be a reality for the future living in this plastic pod um, with these little plaster structures floating around that we all live in individually. And at the time, I, I've been reading a book, I've read lots of books, um, but there was a book that it reminded me of uh, called The Mas Machine Stops, in which um, in the future, everybody lives in this plastic dome underground and the air is not safe to breathe and everything comes to you inside this plastic dome and everyone's in these little pods. Um, so the internet comes to you and you work in your pod and food comes to your pod and you socialize in your pod and it really got me thinking about that and um, I think this that piece on the right really kind of um, reminds me of that book. Um, I'm also currently reading a book called uh, We which is a um, book that was written in the 20s and it was banned in Russia for uh, 60 years and it's all about the future of the 26th century where everyone lives in a glass world and everything see through and everyone can see what each everybody else is doing. So there's all these things coming into play that I'm thinking about um, with the work that I'm creating. So week five, I really started to play around with creating um, invisible worlds and kind of that kind of post pandemic I don't know, maybe slightly apocalyptic, what's left over, is it gonna be the air, is it gonna be the air stored? It's things around us that you can see. So there's all these structures and then you've got kind of like the sealed air going on and will that be left over and in the future, will we be wanting to tap into this sealed air because we're running out of air or the air's too infected or polluted? So I was kind of thinking about that as well. Um, also the packaging I've been using is recyclable 
So I was thinking about that and the environment, and this is all kind of um, going to break down within the next 12 to 24 months, which I really like kind of that the work has a time frame as well, so that it will dissolve and uh, revert back to water. So it isn't kind of infect, uh, affecting and doing damage to the, the environment like so much plastic is as well. So it's kind of lots of different ideas um, coming into play with this. Um, so things just really started to change with the structures and uh, I was thinking about things moving through the air and capturing that and what it would look like and the reflection of the light and how things do move and how um, these organic structures are just kind of everywhere and we don't see them. So this is a kind of another piece that I created. All of these pieces are kind of, uh, the studio is full of all these pieces and um, my aim is to turn them into an installation for next week for my uh, end of my residency, uh, which I'll be doing over the weekend, starting to build it all together. But these are kind of all the different elements that are all starting to come back together, um, which I'm, I've been absolutely enjoying making. I've been in the space and I've been in the studio creating this work and it's just taking a life of its own. It's kind of like I'm allowing almost the materials and the way I can use the materials and manipulate materials to create some of the structures. And to, if I want them to balance or if I don't want them to balance, if I want them to be almost invisible, I've been kind of pl playing with the different um, qualities of the plastic. Um, so in week six, this pair came along. Um, I was thinking about Plato again and um, shapes and structures. So I started making these bigger towers and what would these uh, towers of the future look like and what would these forms be looking like? And would they be organic or would they have the kind of structure of some of the particles or would they be simple shapes and thinking about towers all created of air so um i've started making week six is a real turning point so i started making these kind of almost like hard edged structures um as well as these kind of softer stuff and you can also see that the jiffies are still going on on the left hand side of this photo um drying out um so yeah this is week six and it was soon followed by all of these structures as well. So this is kind of a snapshot of the structures that I created, which I think some of them are very um, building-like. Some of them are kind of moving into slightly sci-fi. I was thinking about um, a film that, you know, scared me to death when I was a kid, The Triffids. And it started kind of like someone said, oh, it's almost like you're making a Triffid. And I was like, oh, yes, I remember The Triffids. And the Triffids used to scare me and that idea of like it tapping on my bedroom window and they were coming to get you. So I think some of that is kind of coming back into this as well as some shapes are kind of feeling a bit more, but they could be things that are in space, a bit more sci-fi. Some of them even look a little bit like spaceships, but it's kind of, there's lots of different things going on in this world. So the studio is starting to fill up with all these different structures and shapes and sculptures. Um, and the jiffies are still there, but after week six, I haven't touched them and I've reached a thousand. So I now have 2000 of my jiffies, but the, uh, this, this installation has taken over now and thinking about what I want to do with it and how I want to take this work forward and what I want to do in the future with my work as well. Um, it just feels like this is kind of, from week six, it's really changed so much and for me, it's just been such a fantastic opportunity to be creating this work and thinking and having time to think and space to almost breathe and think about what am I doing with my work and where do I want to take it. Um, so this was week six. So this is week seven and we're in week seven now. So when I was looking at these images last night, I suddenly realized, wow, I've done a lot of work in the last week. Um, so I started thinking about the qualities of the, um, plastic packaging and making these more sturdy structures that were organic, but also thinking about the light and what would the light look like and how do they react with the light and how would light be affected as well? So that kind of playing with the qualities that the light brings to the structures. And I think for me, it's kind of, it makes them a lot more biological because you can see all the different cells and that's kind of um, coming into it. So I've been playing with the light coming through um, in the studio that I'm in, there's a, a shutter and it's a roller shutter. So I've been lit it, letting little bits of lighting and that's kind of really hitting the work. But also 
I'm letting little bits of air in. So I'm thinking about the sealed air and then the fresh air coming in through the space. So it's kind of a mix of like contained air that could be fresh or I don't know what's in some of it, especially with the air packaging and then the air from outside kind of mixing together. Uh, and this is, a, and then I've started playing with light some more and started thinking about projection and what the work might look like projecting into the space, um, creating my uh, world of the future. I'm kind of going for an installation which people will be able to walk around and engage with and uh, navigate through the space. And it'll be like a whole series of different, um, I think collections of work together, but definitely involve projection and lighting. Um, and I've kind of got an idea for another project, but it's, it's kind of not coming into this one. I was thinking about uh, projecting some of the videos I've been making into the structures as well, but I think that's a future project. Um, and this was literally a day ago. Um, these are my little watchers. I was thinking about video cameras and surveillance and being watched, but also it feels a bit like the War of the Worlds. And I think I'm gonna make a whole series of these and it's all out of air packaging as well. Um, so this is where I'm at right now. Um, this is my kind of week seven. I've got a week to go on my residency. Um, I'm going to be in there building all over the weekend uh, into next week. And hopefully there's going to be uh, an environment that's kind of got projection and lights going on and lots of different structures um, for people to come in and navigate around the space. So yes, um, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Camp, uh, for organising this first huddle. Uh, so yes, my name's Claire Tindale. I'm an artist based in Manchester, and I'm part of a studio group called Paradise Works. I'm interested in spaces, places, and people, and I work primarily with sculpture and site responsive works. Uh, I, I have a focus on using the miniature and variations in scale as a conceptual framework, um, exploring things like pow power balance and vulnerabilities. Quite a lot of my work is site responsive and in terms of places that I've responded to previously, I've responded to a library, so this is Portico Library in Manchester. Um, hospital wards, so I did a residency at uh, Royal Bolton Hospital and a vacated office building in, also in the centre of Manchester. So I'm here today to talk about a recent project, FELT, which was exhibited at the end of May this year. And I will be talking about the journey of the project and the ideas and the philosophy behind the piece um, that developed as a, as a result of this. I initiated this project myself rather than it being a, an open opportunity, an advertised opportunity. And, and I approached the organization Solterre Inspired and the, through them, the venue Salts Mill, with a proposal to develop a site responsive piece to coincide with the Saltaire Arts Trail. Um, this is something that they run on a yearly basis at the end of May on the bank holiday weekend and has lots of art events as part of it. Uh, the initial discussion actually began back in 2017 and uh, it finally reached fruition this year in May 2021. So it's been a, a, a kind of a few years that, that uh, the discussion and the development has taken place. So um, why Salts Mill, you might ask? So I get excited about spaces and the, the, the the roof space, I was aware, aware of the roof space at Salts Mill, which is absolutely stunning. And so I was very keen to try and um, respond to this space and, and produce a piece of work that could potentially be incorporated into the um, Saltaire Arts Trail. 
Um, I'm also interested in uh, kind of the history of places and so interested in the rich history of the uh, and the heritage of the site as a, a woolen textile mill. Um, I'm also interested in industrial model villages and Saltaire is a, an industrial model village. So this, this kind of uh, linked into an area of, of kind of my research interests. Uh, Titus Salt developed the um, salt air. He, he built Salt's mill and um, developed the village around that. He was an industrial philanthropist and created the village and the, and the factory um, outside of Bradford, where his, the, which was the previous location, to escape the smog of Bradford. So he provided amenities such as a park for exercise, a school and a hospital and almshouses, demonstrating a concern for health and the welfare of the workers. He initially he developed um, a, a woolen textile process using alpaca wool. And so it, the, the focus of the factory was on um, woolen textiles. The mill became dilapidated in the years that followed its closure until it was bought by uh, Jonathan Silver in 1987. And at that stage, it was uh, transformed into a, a space for housing individual businesses and retail spaces, as well as a gallery focused on the work of David Hockney. In 2001, it became a national a world heritage site. It achieved world heritage status. And so 2021 marks the 20th anniversary of it achieving this status. So Titus Salt's intention with regard to health and welfare resonated with my own interest in this area and informed the development of the project. There's often a socially engaged element to my practice. And so a natural response to this was to develop a workshop that had therapeutic qualities and involved participants in contributing to the final piece. So this is one of the, the workshops. Uh, this is actually um, taking part at Salt's Mill and the participants are actually making um, woolen houses, uh, needle felted woolen houses that then became become incorporated into the final installation. Uh, having previously used chocolate as a material to reference the model village of Bourneville in my piece Working Towards a Goldilocks Society, it made sense to use wool as the material central to the piece being developed at Saltaire. And so I, 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 excuse me, I identified the needle felting process as a technique to develop the houses for the installation. It uses simple equipment and techniques to transform loose woolen fibers into a solid form but requires skill to achieve this angular form. So uh, this slide shows the, the raw materials. It starts off as loose wool and then using a barbed needle and just repeatedly uh, pressing the needle into the wool, it binds the fibers in, and creates a solid form. And so I developed this, uh, this form, this, this shape, uh, that was like a template that could be used and, and repeated through the workshops. So these, they actually are, are solid wool. There's no form at the center of them. So it's, it's a kind of uh, a repetitive and continuous process that is actually quite therapeutic and you, you kind of just become quite absorbed in, in that needle felting process as you're constructing 
the paces. Uh, the, over these four years, the, there's been a number of um, de delays in developing the project and um, the, including uh, an initial Arts Council bid, which was un unfortunately unsuccessful. And then um, with the impact of COVID, it has meant that the, the, the showing of the work has been delayed. So um, I continued to make the houses during the past year, during uh, COVID. And it was good that I was able to continue to make this component of the installation throughout the various lockdowns. Um, and I actually benefited personally from the therapeutic activity of making the houses. So I developed the, the work over a series of stages. So this is me sitting in a um, a gallery space at a place called Air Gallery in Altrincham. Uh, I had an exhibition there, I got offered a, a solo show, and this is the, the space. And it, it was sort of at the early stages of, of developing the project felt. And so I decided to use the opportunity to um, develop aspects develop sort of some initial ideas for the project. So I used the space, I used the time and the space about a week as a mini residency. So I didn't have anything at the start of the residency and had a week to um, develop the ideas and construct the pieces and play with the space. And it was, it was a really great experience. I got really excited about working with the space and the limitations as well, because I, I knew that I wanted to suspend some of the, the flat felt, but there was nowhere to suspend it on the ceiling. So the kind of the limitations of the space sort of determined how the work manifested in some respects. And actually it, um, it was very useful as a, as a kind of way of dealing with the, the challenges that the, the space at Salts Mill offered as well. So when I first visited um, the, the space at, at Salts Mill, uh, I had my little collection of houses, little collection of houses, and this was one of the roof spaces that I saw and was particularly keen to work with because um, of the, I felt that the colours of the, the wool worked really well in terms of the colours of the space. So this was probably towards the end of 2019 that I visited the space here and um, we asked the, the owners of the mill if we could use this space for the, for the show. And unfortunately, when it got to 2020, which was um, looked like when the exhibition was going to go ahead, it, this space wasn't available due to structural reasons. So they offered me this space instead, which is their, their kind of larger roof space. This is, this is actually half of the full length of the roof space, which was originally a weaving shed sorry, no, a spinning, spinning shed at the mill. Um, and they allowed me some time in that space at the beginning of last year to, to work with the space as a, as a little residency. And um, because, of, uh, because of the way that I worked, I'm working with the, the building, it's important to be within the space itself. So uh, these are some initial kind of tests and, and trying out within that space. Um, that was going to go ahead last year. This was just before lockdown. And so things in terms of working in the space and, and develop, developing those larger scale components 
was slightly put on hold because we were unsure when it was going to next happen. Um, so fortunately it did, by the time it got to this year, we were able to use this space again. And I'll show you the results of that further through the presentation. So I have a tendency to make life difficult for myself and making the houses is a, is a very labor intensive process. And I'd set myself the task of, I wanted to create the number of houses that equate to the number of houses in um, Saltair village at an early stage. So it was a target of around 800. And um, this, this sort of seemed to uh, tie in with um, both Titus Salt and Jonathan Silver in terms of the kind of hard work aspect to developing things and seemed like a common thread. So when I received this fortune in my fortune cookie one day, it seemed very apt and particularly pertinent um, particularly as there's a reference to the needle. So that has that became incorporated into the text about the work. Uh, the handcrafted techniques are intentionally intentionally mimic industrial processes as a means of referencing the kind of the symbiotic relationship between the domestic and the industrial. The home is where the individual has some control over their environment, whereas in industry, they will be answerable to someone else. Oh, sorry. So um, I, within the installation, I combine uh, a series of flat industrially produced felt elements alongside the handcrafted uh, forms created by individuals from various communities through workshops, as well as ones that I've created myself. <clears throat> uh, the wool is all natural, natural colour and it's all um, British breed wool. And um, so here's, a, here's a, a collection of some of the different wools of um, of the sheep involved. Uh, th this, the, the reason for this is because with consideration to sustainability. So um, what the, the project brought about some really beautiful connections and um, a woman called Jenny from Orkney, she's a shepherdess, she approached us uh, quite early on in the project and asked if she could be involved in the project. Um, and she was, she has a rare breed um, British sheep and she proposed to use the felt, the, sorry, use the wool from her sheep to, to generate some needle felted houses. And um, she has a connection with Saltair because she actually went to school there as a child and her mum still lived there. So this was a really beautiful connection. And, and um, of course, uh, I said, absolutely, yes, please do get involved. And um, it, it, it was just a, a very beautiful thing because she'd, we'd have conversations via email and she'd share information and updates on her sheep. Uh, who are all individually named. I think there's um, ones off the top of my head. There's an Oreo, there's a Dorothy, there's a Bolly, um, a Domino. Um, so those, those are a few of the ones that I can remember. Um, and these are the final sh um, houses that she produced from with the wool from her sheep. So this is them as a collection. And this is them as a grouping within the installation. So 
So one, one of the things that the, the work also references is uh, the aspect of water. So water is a really important um, aspect in terms of the siting and the location of salt air because it is on a, a riv both a river and a canal, which um, in, the, in, in the early days were used for both transportation, but also as a water supply for, for the washing that took place in the processing of the wool at the, um, at the mill. So um, I'm using kind of these transparent balls to reference those, that kind of element of water that, and the importance of it. So they're, they're kind of bubbles that could be bubbles within the water, but also um, bubbles in terms of uh, ideas and imagination because um, Titus Salt was very innovative in, uh, he was the first person that was able to use alpaca wool and he, he found a way of processing and using it where no other person had previously managed to do. So the, the, wool, the wool got washed within the, um, the mill as part of the processing, but also a piece of information um, that I found out uh, and that kind of stuck with me when I was researching the, the village and, and the mill was the, the thing to do with um, laundry and the wash house. So Titus Salt, um, built a wash house for the residents of Saltaire. Um, and because he, he didn't want to see people putting their washing out across the street. So uh, in spite of this, there, there wasn't much uptake and, and the residents actually seemed to shun this amenity as they considered it was too expensive. And so they continued to hang their laundry out, outside so these strips of white felt within the space are kind of referencing that, um, <laughs> that act, I suppose, in a sort of quite abstract way, that sort of act of defiance in terms of the, the hanging out of the laundry. Uh, this is a view of, a bigger view of the space and the, the whole installation. So the, um, there's one long strip of felt, the flat felt along the center of the space. And this is reflect, re, to reflect, reflect the, um, the sheer scale of production at the height of the industry at, at Salt's Mill, when um, a staggering 17 miles of woolen fabric would be produced each day. And so this is is to sort of reflect that kind of continuation and this idea of a, a kind of a process, a, a, a long process. So um, I'm gonna show a film, a little, a short film now, which is a 360 film of the space. Um, Katie, just let me know if it doesn't work. It should work when I just click, click go. Will do. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, all okay, Claire. Thank you. So the difficulties, there were difficulties of working on the scale um, that I did here uh, to try and sort of occupy the space. And um, I needed to sort of test out the stability of the towers with the drums, uh, with the felt. And so this is something in terms of pra in practicality terms, this is something that you can only really do when you're in the space um, because the, this, uh, this space is 60 meters long. So some of the kind of the logistics and the designing of the piece actually happens quite late on because um, this piece, this piece um, was going to be in the other roof space, 
and then had to be adapted this year to this space. Um, it, because of the COVID restrictions, we didn't know until quite late on when, um, whether it was going to be possible to run this year. And, and equally, it was late on this year that I was able to get access to the space. So um, quite a lot of the designing and the construction of elements happened quite late on. Uh, this one, it's one of my, it's actually the most ambitious piece that I've produced to date. And I developed, as part of it, I developed a sound element to it. Um, so this is the recording because the, the actual sounds of the needle going into the, the wool has, uh, is, is, sounds quite industrial in when you, when you record it. So I had a sound component as part of the installation. And this is uh, the, the recording of that. So I'm just going to try the, the sound now. Yeah. I'm, just go I'm going to play the sound for you now. Yeah, that's working, Claire. Okay, so um, that also adds to this idea. I, I like sort of slight ambiguity in terms of that sound in the space. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got a recording of the, the sound within, within the space, but it was there were three stations and there was a delay between the three stations. Um, but there's the idea that um, it feels like in something industrial. And so it's a kind of blurring of those bound of those kind of um, delineations between industry and um, the the hand constructed. So events along the way enhance and contribute to the narrative of the work. And in this instance, um, a fortune in a fortune cookie, wool from individual sheep in Orkney and uh, various workshops, including a one with recovering addicts, were just some of the events that enriched the experience of working on the project and provided even greater meaning to the piece. So this was a collective, a collective um, effort. And by working together collectively, um, a, a, a new community was built out of the individual communities. So um, if you haven't seen the piece, and I, I'm guessing that um, most of you won't have seen the piece if, uh, because it sounds like you're, you're all down southwest, mostly down southwest way. Um, so if you haven't seen it in person, there could be another opportunity to sh see it in September. Uh, when it, I, I'm hoping it's going to be shown as part of the Saltaire Festival. So if you would like me to let you know about this or any other of my upcoming events, feel free to get in touch um, via any of the, the links below, um, or you can sign up um, to my mailing list via my website. Um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Yeah, so morning everyone. And I can just see like a little strip of people down the side. Feel free to have your cameras off or on um, and do what you need to do. So I'm just going to talk for maybe 20 minutes at the most and then kind of encourage a bit of discussion around some of the um, ideas that I've brought up. If anyone has any issues hearing me or anything, please just say that'd be good. Okay, so yeah, so. Right, so um, yeah, so my name's Kyra Norman. I'm an artist living down on the Lizard Peninsula, which is the very south 
southerly tip of Cornwall. Um, so I'm about two hours south of Truro. And um, yeah, it's really nice to have this opportunity to connect with people in Manchester and Aberdeen and Plymouth and even Truro and further afield. Um, so I've been working for the last since for June and July on a residency here in Cornwall that would have been at an arts centre called Crowdy, which is based in Red Roof. Um, and my initial proposal was to really um, to really kind of inhabit a space there for two months and invite people into that space to join me um, to discuss ideas around um, movement, connection and place, which are the three sort of main kind of materials, if you like, that I tend to be working with. Um, and so I just wanted to talk briefly about that, that my um, practice sort of comes from initial training in dance and choreography and then moving more, that was sort of in the late 90s and then moving more into working with installation and video art and now in this kind of mix between the two. Um, two. So um, I think one of the big things that I'd be interested to hear from you about at the end when we're sort of talking more um, uh, informally is about this idea about how the last 16 months have really shifted our experience of movement, connection and place and what those, what the possibilities for those are. I mean, particularly in terms of movement as an artist that's usually quite mobile and traveling around quite a lot, that's obviously um, been a big shift in the last 16 months to be really rooted in my home place for um, most of my work. And then connection, I'm really interested in how um, software like Zoom, for example, have enabled us to have more sort of international conversations perhaps than um, might have been the case before in the sort of the way that they can become embedded into just our daily life, like the way this morning's going. And then also um, questions around place and what it means, specifically for me, what it means to be an artist um, living on the Lizard Peninsula and responding to my location. And so already I can see really nice kind of echoes of some of the um, ideas that Anna and Claire were talking about, which I sort of try and thread in as I go along. So um, specifically for this residency, what I was proposing was a project Cosmic Fabric. And if you're interested in finding out I've written quite a bit about it at this link here and hopefully you can now see. So this is the residency that I'm undertaking at the moment, Cosmic Fabric, and this is the link to more information about that project. Um, and what I wanted it to be, which is, yeah, is kind of unfolding to be, is a movement research process which sort of incorporates a series of conversations, workshops and practical events. And all of this is inspired by the unique geology of the Lizard Peninsula where I live. So um, what I've been talking about a lot over the last couple of months in talks like this and in person is um, the actual kind of material fabric of this place where I'm standing now talking to you, because the Lizard Peninsula is kind of a um, grouping of different types of rock that should never really have been seen. We shouldn't really be able to see it. It should still be buried under the mantle of the earth. And through a series of kind of geological accidents, it's kind of been pushed up over a you know, almost unimaginably long period of time to form initially an ancient seabed and then gradually um, the land where we are today until eventually we can sort of actually hold lumps of it. And one of the things that I, um, I don't think you can see is if I unshare my screen for a minute. Does this work? I'm putting zoom through its paces now. Stop share, there we go. So can people see me again? Perhaps. Yes, sorry. Can no, no, that's good. Be quick enough. <laughs> so it's a bit too much audience participation being required here. Sorry. So um, what I wanted to hold up for you now, this is a lump of um, serpentine, which is a very particular rock, which is only found in a very few um, places on the surface of the earth, including the Lizard Peninsula. And this, as you can see, is a piece that's broken off quite recently from Kynance Cove, which is um, just about two miles away. And one of the things that I've been exploring over the last um, couple of months is the journey from this to this, which is a, another piece of serpentine that's become kind of smooth and is actually, um, I guess you can see, this is really sort of jagged and actually quite sharp. And this is really smooth and um, kind of a very different tactile experience. And so one of the things I've been researching in these movement workshops is the sort of transition from one, one of those phases to the other. And it was reminding me in Claire's talk about this, her fortune cookie about the constant grinding that can turn an iron rod into a needle. One of the things that I've been exploring is the constant sort of grinding from the sea and rocks that can turn stone into a kind of smooth and tactile experience. So if I go back to screen sharing. Uh, 
that's working, isn't it? Yeah, all good. So, yeah, so um, so what I've been doing over these last two, uh, there we go. So I'm just sharing with you now a um, close-up shot of the same. So this is um, Kynance Cove, about two miles from here. And this is me standing on top. This is taken from standing on top of a large sort of rock formation and looking down into some of the rock pools that are forming on top of that surface. And that's the surface that these rocks I was just showing you um, have come from. And one of the things I find, as someone that's really interested in movement, what I find really exciting about Finance Cove is not only the kind of, um, the fact that it's a place that's sort of been formed through thousands and thousands of years of movement, but that it's also continues to be on the move as a physical place and as a material and that it's always shifting and changing. And also that it attracts a lot of um, people to come and visit it. And it's really interesting to go there and just people watch and kind of observe how as a site it invites particular kinds of movement behaviors. So obviously there's kind of going and it's, a, it's at the coast, people want to get in the sea, this kind of thing. People know how to behave physically at the coast is one of the things that I'm exploring. Um, and also that people go, because it's a very beautiful view from that point, that people make these en enormous journeys down the length of the country or from other countries to stand at this point and just be totally still and look out onto this expanse of sea. So, um, yeah, so then one of the things I've been doing over the last couple of months is thinking, how do I then take those movement behaviours and develop kind of verbal scores and suggestions that I can offer to people um, either online or as audio recordings um, to explore in their own places where they are that will create some kind of physical experience for them that also responds to these environments. So for example, I could um, maybe I'll talk through one of those towards the end and see, yeah, it'd be interesting to get some feedback on that. So yeah, so, um, so basically at the moment, I'm now seven weeks in. And so the first three weeks really um, require quite a lot of roving around, finding sites to gather people and start research for some of these ideas. And then I had about three weeks of working at the auction house in Red Roof, and more latterly St Andrew's Church Hall in Red Roof, and kind of seeing how these environments could operate as places to contain some of these movement ideas that were drawn from um, the kind of material where I am here. And how it's looking at the moment is that there will be a sort of live performance event that comes from this project that will be working with probably eight other performers and we will spend some time at Lizard sort of researching on the actual rocks for a period of time. And then this performance will kind of make its way up the coast path to Helston, where there'll be a kind of live installation performance drawing on all of this material. And then there'll also be a kind of, um, I guess one of the questions I was, one of the thoughts I had for Claire around whether her work having been made so much for a particular site, whether it can then sort of migrate to other places is perhaps kind of um, something I'm reflecting on myself about how to make something that can respond um, kind of meaningfully to the site where it's created, but then how it can be kind of lifted into another site and find a new um, iteration or a new perspective on it. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about the Lizard Peninsula is that I feel like in a way, um, so in the kind of, um, in its sort of geological history, at this point it's attached to Cornwall, but it, that hasn't always been the case. So as this little landmass that I'm standing on now was initially connected to Africa and then was kind of pushed under great force up um, to attach itself to first of all mainland Europe and then to break off and be attached to Cornwall. And I think particularly with the kind of um, narratives in this country around migration and around Brexit and this kind of thing, to be living on a landmass that has a fairly provisional, if there's some relationship to the rest of the UK is in itself quite interesting. And so, yeah, so the idea is that this, this kind of project is very much rooted here, but could also travel in the way that the Lizard Peninsula potentially can travel. And then maybe the last thing I would talk through is, um, so this is a kind of, one of the things that interests me in this image um, is the kind of variation of is the sense of scale and this kind of for me I guess was connecting back to um, the work that Anna's talking about about making these jiffies which are like one one hundredth of a, of a second 
and this kind of um, creating time in this way. There's something about kind of, the, of zooming into and zooming out of a rock kind of material that is opening up questions for me about the duration of um, this particular project and when it starts and ends. Um, I'm just going to come ahead and let's go to the next one. So again, this is a kind of, um, I'm quite interested in these images and the kind of sense, the kind of um, way that they kind of play, the way that this kind of invites you to wonder about the scale of the material that we're looking at. And then I've also been doing things about just placing a figure in that um, environment so that you can see a kind of body in relation to the, the, um, the rock. And then the last image I'm gonna show you is here. And this is, um, so this is um, one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last seven weeks is about how, because the Lizard Peninsula is made out of this really unique material, it creates the conditions for other living things to thrive and to partially reinvent themselves. So there are types of clover that only grow on particular rocks, on particular parts of the lizard and this kind of thing. And how, as a kind of, wider sense how in my own practice I might kind of um, sort of start to identify and embrace the kind of um, part, the aspects of my approach that are maybe going to create new uh, conditions for participants to um, yeah to kind of reimagine their own possibilities I guess. So um, I had another thing I wanted to say but I think I'd really like to open this up to some sort of discussion first and then Kind of be prompted by uh, that, if that's okay, because I feel like I have to talk for a long time. Okay, great. Okay, so um, yeah, so if I could ask people to return to a sort of gallery view for a minute, if that's comfortable. We don't have to have cameras on, but if you do, that's great. Thank you. And um, I think one of the things that I've been finding over this last sort of 16 months is I, my whole practice has always been very much about being in a physical space with other people and kind of working to develop some sense of connection in real time and space. And I think similarly to when Claire was talking about a needle felting workshop, how that would normally be taking place, sitting in a circle, inviting conversation and so on. I really notice now how um, the sort of some of the restrictions that we're under with regards to COVID kind of put these real barriers to conversation and exchange. And so um, a lot of this kind of um, residency process has been how can I kind of continue to invite those sorts of aspects into my practice and also to, um, to share what I'm thinking about and talking about, but not in a way that's saying that's kind of um, definitive and it's kind of open to being influenced by other people's perspectives and so on. So I guess slightly on the hoof, I'm trying to think how to bring that, that sort of sense, that sensibility into this talk, because, um, and so it's not just a lecture kind of thing, I think. So what I'd like to ask if people are happy to do so would be if people would just unmute and say, maybe just say where they're from, where they are, and what it's like there to have some sort of sense of who I'm with. But obviously not if we don't want to. I'm in St Ives. Yay, thank you. And how is it there? It's very hot. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I'm based in Truro, also in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. uh, currently very sunny, very hot, um, but there is a little bit of a breeze, so okay. it's, it's not unbearable. Great, good. Who was that? Because I can only see four people at once. Oh, if you, if you go up to the top right, can you see the view? No, no I'm on a phone. So you can oh, see. yeah. Yeah. That was Rachel Coward, Mary. Thank you. Um, so as I've just started speaking, I'll tell you, uh, Kyra, I'm here on the east side of uh, central Plymouth. So quite close to the Embankment River. Um, so it's slightly less hot than other bits of Plymouth, but it's still uh, warm and it's the kind of hot that feels like we're going to have a storm, mm -hmm. I would say. I don't know if we are. 
I'm Rachel. I'm also in the east, but the northeast of Scotland. Um, are we exclusively talking about the weather? Or no. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's very British. It's always like a great thing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, um, something about the conditions there. I think about about the conditions there, or what it's like, or just giving us a little flavour of what's happening up there. The conditions, sure. Um, so we're we're on the coast, so um, certainly there's a lot of um, interesting points in terms of geology. We are also dominated by an oil and gas sector and have been since the 1970s. So uh, lots of relationships to um, and metaphors around extraction. Mm, thank you. Yeah, just, if any, just before anyone else steps forward to say where they are, just the word extraction is really interesting here at the moment. I've been thinking about that a lot in terms of um, Kind of what, as an artist working this site, what my relationship to place is in terms of like these kind of very extractive models. Because people are talking in Cornwall now again, but the Cornwall has a big mining history, and there's some sort of discussion around mining for lithium for um, batteries for um, electric cars and things. And this kind of thing around kind of extractive models of um, responding to site, and then kind of yeah, I've been wondering what the other what the opposite would be whether that's sort of more sort of nurturing or tending or those kind of words sound a lot more like looking after a place. And um, yeah, thank you. So that's really interesting to build my memory about that. Hello, I'm uh, Steph Shipley. I'm on the, currently on the island of Anglesey, uh, okay. off the coast of North Wales, and by the sea. And yes, it's very hot and humid, but the light is very beautiful early in the morning and evening. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Laura and it's kind of tropical here because uh, we watered the plants this morning and uh, now the water is sort of steaming off of the concrete. Yeah. Um, other than that, it's kind of, I'd say it's sleepy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I'm Claire, I'm in Manchester, and um, like everyone else, it's, it's very hot. And uh, it's, uh, I'm in one of the coolest places in the house. Uh, it's kind of interesting that you have to kind of move around the house to some rooms are hotter, hotter than others. And um, I'm quite envious of Laura there out, outside. I think she's got the right idea. <laughs> but uh, our backyard is just sort of, because we've got a backyard, a terraced house, and so that kind of, um, you know, retains the heat. And although we've got greenery out there, it's, uh, it's not enough to um, give you sort of comfortable shade to sit in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm looking for, I hate to say it, but I'm looking forward to uh, the temperature dropping <laughs> before too long. Yeah. Um, I'm Liza and I'm I'm at Maker Heights because I'm doing the Rain Projects residency. Oh, nice. So, yeah, it's a, it's a gorgeous day today. It's a lot more cloud than it has been for the past few days, but it's a little bit cooler, which is nice because yeah. I was out in the heat yesterday and it was stifling. But um, it's beautiful to be surrounded by sea because it's obviously mm. a bit um, So that's been, yeah, very open sort of space. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, so that's more the sort of feeling of how I wanted my residency to be, more that I would be in this, I think I forgot to say the crucial bit at the start, which is, so my residency would have been hosted at Crowdy, which is an arts centre in Redroof. And the day before the residency were, was announced, there was a really quite significant fire at Crowdy and um, a lot, uh, in the kiln rooms there, and quite a few self-employed artists that had space at Crowdy lost everything. They lost their livelihoods and all their work. And um, so Crowdy is still being kind of, and also then just the process of putting the fire out, there was a lot of water damage to other spaces. So um, it was immediately apparent that the residency couldn't happen there and would have to kind of make its own home in different parts of the, of the town. So part of um, 
yeah so that's why part of my process at the start was about like making connections with other people that ran alternative spaces and finding a place to be for the two months um and because yeah my initial vision will be to have this space that people can just drop in and out and have you know look at just exchanges about yeah, just have you have you blah and things like this, and that, that would gradually kind of create a, create the conditions for sort of deeper conversations around movement and place and belonging and these kind of things that that living here sort of throws up for me. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it's fair to say I'm still working out what the strategies are for creating that as an alternative, but it feels important to me to continue trying to um, make the process permeable um, because. Yeah, because that's what this opportunity feels like as well. That it's not, um, you know, I think it's something that I've been talking with about people that have been able to make the journey down to Red Reef and be in various spaces with me over the last couple of months. Is this kind of thing that I think probably all of us here have had to be very self sufficient over the last 16 months and really sort of stand on our own two feet to kind of feel like we can carry on in lots of ways. And actually, that's been that's a real that's brilliant in lots of ways, but it's also not the only thing. And that's nice to be able to feel kind of influenced by people and also to have conversations with people who are like approaching things from a totally different perspective as well so yeah so that's what I've been trying to do is sort of try and challenge my own get out of my bubble <laughs> a bit and kind of re reconnect um yeah and so what the um what the outcome the sort of final outcome there's going to be a sort of formative outcome but the final outcome which I'm hoping as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking, oh, this could be the thing that I finished with, is that um, I'm hoping to kind of gather some of the ideas, some of these very scattered ideas that I've had over the last few months into a sort of booklet, which is inspired by this. I'm just going to hold up and try and show you. Um, so this is like, you don't need to worry about, looking, about reading the um, text, but this is a, it may be reversed, in fact, a little booklet called Beneath the Skin of the Lizard that was written by um, two of my neighbours. And it's the sort of book, if you came down here on your holidays, if you were going past like the National Trust little shop kiosk, they'd be selling as a book of walks you can go on in the local area. And each walk tells you a bit about that particular geology. So it's a really nice kind of introduction to um, the specific materials that, uh, yeah, that I'm sort of exploring, I guess. And it's um, sort of over the last four weeks I've been starting to think I want to create a similar kind of scale publication that pulls together some of the kind of conversations that I've had over the last few months and also these kind of movement scores that I've been developing about this kind of taking sort of geological language and trying to apply it in the body and work out how that what that would be so if I give an example of that because I realize that's quite vague and you might want to have your camera on for this off for this just to kind of experience it for a little minute um so I'm just gonna say if you would like to Close your eyes, you don't have to, but um, or let you just sort of relax your vision a bit. And this, so this is a score that's taken from a particular kind of sediment, sedimenting process by which the lizard is formed. And the idea is if you imagine that wherever you're sitting or standing or lying in space, you're just letting your body just rest into that sediment. So you're basically taking on the conditions of a rock pit. So you're just letting your body rest into the sediment and noticing how that can just like allow the body to soften a bit and kind of noticing which parts of your body are in contact with that sediment and which are kind of above that out in the air. And so when I've been working with people in the spaces in Red Reef, we've been mainly doing this lying down so you get a really nice lot of contact with the sediment. So this might be something you might be interested in trying afterwards or um, just to give you an idea of even standing, it's just the surfaces of the feet or sitting, it's just the surfaces that are in contact with the ground or the chair and then thinking about just moving just changing that imprint slightly in some way so just a small shift and then another kind of small shift in the space and um yeah and these are schools that i've been working with groups of people with sort of people with movement past movement experience and people that are just curious and we've been um yeah we've been sort of gathering together and trying these things and actually even um Although it is a, it's a sort of internalized physical experience, it's not about creating a, a sort of form in the body. Inevitably, of course, a series of small movements do create forms in the body. And then um, if you'd like to open your eyes again now, you're welcome to do so. And I guess the sort of thing is if we were working together for longer, if this was like an actual workshop rather than just the sort of stuff, then um, what's quite nice is that it kind of creates a sort of sense of 
community doing something together quite quickly. And so that's what we've been, that's just an example. So there might be a little written score for that in the little book. Eventually. Okay, I think I'm going to leave that there. <laughs>